Good Yantif and Lashana Tova. After such a year, after such a week, there is so much to pray for. Thank God for these holy days. For those who are joining us from home through the live stream, we welcome you to the sanctuary as well. I hope you have your candles lit nearby. I hope you have a High Holy Day prayer book nearby. If you don't already have a copy of the prayer book, you're welcome to pick up a gift copy from Holy Blossom anytime in the coming days. For those in the sanctuary, just a few notes to keep in mind. First of all, uh, there are exits behind you as well as in front of you. The ramped exit is uh, through the Alice and Bernard Herman Chapel. Our ushers are here to help you if you should need a machsor or directions. Uh, you can call on them. I do ask that everyone please silent your phones. That's a big help. And these High Holy Days will not be business as usual because we have so very much to pray for, so much to reflect upon, because so much has changed since we gathered last year. We hold Israel very close in our prayers tonight, and I share with you a brand new prayer written just for this moment. Source of all life, master of compassion, grant peace to your people Israel and keep them safe in the shadow of your wings. Whether they are now in public shelters or in safe rooms, stairwells or basements, Spread the shelter of your peace over all your people, the elderly, the infants, the soldiers on the front lines, the teachers, the religious and the secular, the Tel Avivi and the Yerushalmi. Protect them so that they may lie down in peace tonight and wake up to peace and life renewed. Our God and God of our ancestors, we ask that their skies will be still and the heavens not thunder, so that they, when they look up into the darkness of this new moon, this night of Rosh Chodesh Tishrei, they will see a sky lit only by stars and the promise of peace, which we share with them on this New Year's Eve. Amen. We begin on page 23. בחודש השביעי, באחד לחודש יהיה לכם שבתון, זיכרון תרועה מקרא קודש, כל מלאכת עבודה לא תעשו. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, there shall be a sacred assembly, a cessation from work, a day of commemoration proclaimed by the sound of the shofar. Ki hokli Israel hu. Amen. May it be your will, eternal our God, God of all generations, that the year 5,700 and 85, bring to us and the whole house of Israel life and peace, joy and exaltation, redemption and comfort, and let us say, Amen. <laughs> 
Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bidvaro Ma'ariv Aravim, Bechokma Poteach Sha'arim, Uvitvuna Mishane Itim, Umachalif et Hazmanim, Umsader et Hakochavim, Bemishmuro Teham Barakia Kirtsono, Bore Yom Valaila, Golel Or Mipne Hoshech, Bechoshech Mipne Or, Umavir Yom Umevi Laila, Umavdil Ben Yom Uven Laila, Adonai Tsevaot Shemo, El Chai Vekayam, Tamid Yimloch Aleinu Leolam Vaed, Baruch Ata Adonai, Hamaariv Aravim. Ahavat Olam, with everlasting love, as thou love, as thou love the house of Israel, Israel, Beit Israel, Am Ha'avta, Ha'avat
Ata et Aruna Elohecha, Behol of Abha, the Hon of Shaha, Uva Home Odeha, Uva Yu, Hadavarim, Ale, Asher Anochi, it's Abha. What does it mean to be a Jew? You shall be holy. What does it mean to be a Jew? You shall be a holy people. To hold fast to our vision of truth, to retain our faith in tomorrow. Holy in our past is the memory of redemption from Egyptian bondage. Holy in our day is the hope of redemption we still await. Twice holy in our past are those who gave their lives to hallow this world. Jew today and tomorrow bears witness to the goodness of life. And holy are those whose lives are songs in freedom's cause.
Rosaleidu Sukkot Shalomecha Baruch Ata Aronai Apore Sukkot Shalom Aleinu Ve'al Kol Amo Yisrael Ve'al Yerushalayim May we lie down this night in peace and rise up to life renewed. May night spread over us a shelter of peace, of quiet and calm, the blessing of rest. There will come a time when morning will bring no word of war or famine or anguish. There will come a day of happiness, of contentment and peace. Praise be the source of joy within us for the night and its rest, for the promise of peace. Ikadol ve ikadash mei rabah Ani Be'am adivrach erute Be'am lich malchute V'chayechon v'yomechon U'v'chayelechom ed Yisrael
You are holy, your name is holy, and those who strive to be holy declare your glory day by day. Eternal God, cause all your works to stand in awe before you, and all that you have made to tremble at your presence. Let all that lives revere you, and all creation turn to you in worship. Let them all become a single family, doing your will with a perfect heart. For well we know, eternal God, that yours is the majesty, yours is the might, and awesome is your name in all creation. <laughs> Grant honor to your people, glory to those who revere you, hope to those who seek you, and courage to those who trust you. Bless your land with gladness and your city with joy and cause the light of redemption to dawn for all who dwell on earth. <laughs> Sadikim Yeru Ismahu, 
Isharim Yalozu, Vachasidim Barina Yagilu, Viola Tati Patspeha, the Horisha Kula Kehasha. Hallelujah. <laughs> In love and favor, O God, you have chosen us from all the peoples, hallowing us with your mitzvot. Our sovereign, you have summoned us to your service, that through us your great and holy name may become known in all the earth. In your love, O God, you have given us this day of remembrance to hear the sound of the shofar, to unite in worship, and to recall the exodus from Egypt. Eloheinu velohe avoteinu, ya'ale v'yavo, v'zacher zichroneinu, v'zichron kol amcha v'et Yisrael l'fanecha, l'tova l'chein u'l'chesed, u'l'rachamim l'chaim u'l'shalom, b'yom hazikaron hazeh, zochreinu adon Eloheinu, bo, our 
our God and God of all ages, be mindful of your people Israel on this day of remembrance and renew in us love and compassion, goodness, life, and peace. This day, remember us for well-being. Amen. This day, bless us with your nearness. Amen. This day, help us to live. Our God and God of our ancestors, may you rule in glory over all the earth and let your grandeur be acclaimed throughout the world. Reveal the splendor of your majesty to all who dwell on earth, that all your works may know you as their maker and all the living acknowledge you as their creator. Then all who breathe shall say, the sovereign God of Israel is the one whose dominion extends to all creation. Ancestors, sanctify us with your mitzvot and let your Torah be our way of life. Satisfy us with your goodness, gladden us with your salvation, and purify our hearts to serve you in truth. For you, O oh God, are truth, and your word is true forever. Blessed is the Eternal, who hallows the house of Israel and the day of remembrance.
gratefully acknowledge that you are the eternal God, the God of our people, the God of all generations. You are the rock of our life, the power that shields us in every generation. We thank you and sing your praises for our lives which are in your hand, for our souls which are in your keeping, for the miracles which are daily with us, and for your wondrous gifts at all times, morning, noon, and night. You are goodness, your mercies never end, you are compassion, your love never fails. You have always been our hope. For all these things, O sovereign God, let your name be forever exalted and blessed, and that life ab abundant be the heritage of all the children of your covenant. O God, our Redeemer and Helper, let all who live affirm you and praise your name in truth. Eternal God, whose nature is goodness, we give you thanks and praise.
ארתנו, שמה קולנו, אבינו מלכנו, חתנו לפניך, אבינו מלכנו, חמול עלינו, ויעלול עלינו את I don't often speak personally, but this evening as we welcome in the new Jewish year, it seemed like a good time to speak about my grandmother, Becky Silk. Earlier this year, some of you may know that she was diagnosed with stomach cancer. It was admittedly scary for her, for me, and for our family. We didn't know for a while what was going on or what the outcome would be. What was making her feel ill? Would she need treatment or surgery? Would she be okay? In the end, the result was a major, major surgery, one that would see the surgeons remove approximately two-thirds of her stomach. This was back in April, and coincidentally, her operation was on another Chag, on Erev Pesach. To spoil things from the top, my family experienced a small miracle and all the cancer was caught, so there was no further action required. Thank God. 
Ever since, it's been a process of healing and recovery as she's learning to properly eat again and figure out what her new capabilities and capacities will be. It has been and still is a moment of great vulnerability for her, the book of life and death literally open in front of her on the operating table. In the delicate days, weeks, and months that have followed, she's had to swallow her pride, accept help, rely on others, and grapple with a fragility that she knows all too well but was still far too close for comfort. That deep vulnerability is completely understandable or even natural and is in fact a very Jewish way of being. Furthermore, as we welcome in 5785, we learn that vulnerability is especially crucial to celebrating and commemorating this time of year together. When we hear Avinu Malkenu Kotvenu Besefer Chaim Tovim, our parent, our sovereign, inscribe us for goodness in the book of life, we know the melody, we just knew the melody right now, as if it was ingrained in our DNA. And perhaps you notice that often as we sing it, we sway back and forth. It's not part of the davenography, it's instinctual. We feel these words in our souls and our swaying is akin to our trembling before the divine as we come to understand that we only have so much control that there is an element of fate that is completely out of our hands, and so all we can do is sway and pray. When we hear Barosh Hashanah Yikatevun Ove Yomsom Kippur Yachatemun, Mi Yichie U Mi Yamut, on Rosh Hashanah it is written, on Yom Kippur it is sealed, who shall live and who shall die. Perhaps your stomach drops or forms even the tiniest of pits in recognition that there is much that we don't know, that we can't predict, that we are but flesh and blood and as such cannot see into the future. That's a terrifying thought. And the drama of these words and the haunting of their music reminds us of how small and feeble we humans are. Yet, Repentance, worships, and acts of righteous justice alleviate the harshness of God's decree. Put differently, although vulnerability feels like we are simply being told that we are weak and there is nothing that we can do about it, this may not be the case. There is at least some power in our hands as we seek to respond to the challenges of our day and in which we are all living with our nerves exposed. Vulnerability, we come to recognize, is not just a key component of Rosh Hashanah or even just our High Holy Days, but of our Jewish tradition more broadly. According to the Torah, Moses received two sets of tablets upon which the Ten Commandments were written. In the book of Exodus, Moses goes up Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights and comes back down. Upon seeing his fellow Israelites, who'd grown increasingly concerned, increasingly impatient, and increasingly skeptical in Moses' absence, dancing around a golden calf, worshipping it as their deity, he becomes so incensed that he lifts the tablets above his head and smashes them to the ground. Moses then climbs Mount Sinai once more and, after a heated discussion with God, who is also enraged, crafts a replacement set of the Ten Commandment tablets and brings them back down the mountain, his people now fully on board after reckoning, reckoning with their wrongdoing. Our rabbinic tradition will put a spin on this. The Talmud in Tractate Bava Batra teaches us that the day Moses descended Mount Sinai with the second set of tablets was none other than Yom Kippur. Following this, when asked what happened to the first set of tablets, Rabbi Yosef will teach us that they were placed into the Ark of the Covenant and thereby transported around with the Israelites throughout their wilderness wanderings. On second day Rosh Hashanah, we will read from the book of Genesis chapter 22 known as the Akedah, the binding of Isaac 
We're likely familiar with the story. Abraham is commanded, Kachna et bincha et yechidcha asher ahavta, to take now your son, your only one, the one you love, and sacrifice him. Together with their servants, they journey towards Mount Moriah, Isaac being placated along the way when he inquires as to why they have no animal to offer. At that ultimate moment of encounter, Isaac tied to the wood on the makeshift altar, his father standing with a knife over him. An angel grabs Abraham's wrist, preventing him from committing this unimaginable deed. Instead, a ram caught in the thickets becomes a symbol of relief given freely to God by Abraham in thanksgiving for saving his son's life. The two men, father and son, then separate Abraham heading to Beersheba, and Isaac, well, we're left with a cliffhanger. The Torah text doesn't tell us how this story ends. Did father and son return together? What was their conversation on the way back? How has this justified to Sarah waiting for them at home? How did the parental relationship change forever because of this very near miss? Israeli poet Chaim Guri imagines what might have transpired in his piece Yerusha, Inheritance. The last stanza reads, Aval et ahahi horish hem noldim belibam. Nonetheless, at that hour he gave to his progeny an inheritance. They are born and a knife is in their heart. In other words, we carry these broken pieces, the tablets and our hearts with us, but they become part of our greater whole. This brokenness is almost taken for granted, something we all live with that is inherent to us. Of course we're vulnerable, we're human, we're Jewish, and we're part of the story too. What we still do not hear, including in this poem, is the end of the story which means we have a chance to write it for ourselves. So I'm here tonight to ask, what if we rethought vulnerability? If it is simply part of the human and part of the human uh, and part of the Jewish condition, what if we viewed it not as something to turn away from, but as a virtue which helps to reshape and reform us from what we were before into what we are truly becoming? This trait might be known as resilience, defined by Michael Dixon and Naomi Baum in their book, Is Resilience, as the ability to withstand difficulties, bounce back after troubles and continue on, even in the face of gathering storm clouds. Although the book was released before October 7, it is this resiliency that Dixon and Baum believe carries Israel through the ups and downs of life in the Middle East and allows them not just to survive, but thrive. After all, we might remember that native-born Israelis are known as sabras, named for the cactus-like plant that grows in Israel's soil, notoriously prickly and tough on the outside, but soft and sweet on the inside. In his resilience, Michael Dixon and Naomi Baum play out this deeply characteristic Israeli thick skin and posit that there are three aspects of resiliency from which we can learn much as well. Key one is empathy, framed as the skill of identifying our own feelings and the feelings of others, to be sensitive and self-aware of them. By necessity, we can't avoid emotions, including those which are difficult or painful or sad, even if our natural inclination might be to shut down or become numb. Our Israeli brothers and sisters, according to Baum and Dixon, tend to be relatively open with their feelings, but this openness might just be the secret to their success. Key two is flexibility. This refers to the ability to approach life in a dynamic way to expect the unexpected and roll with it as a result. Sometimes we encounter a roadblock or we hear a no when we expect a yes. 
Flexibility is an aptitude for changing course, for making different choices and having a wide range of responses in our back pockets so that we can deal with whatever curveballs are thrown our way. Key three is meaning making. Dixon and Baum cite the famous psychoanalyst and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl, who would often credit his own survival to holding a firm grip onto the idea that if you ascribe purpose to your life, you can get through almost anything. It is an imperative ingredient to reaching understanding because although we may not have the answers to these hard questions, it can be encouraging to bring the discussion around to why something, probably something bad, if I'm going to guess, has happened, and how we can make peace with it. Acknowledging that we may not have any easy solutions can often lead to the building of resilience. I saw this resilience in real time when I visited Israel in March on a solidarity mission with the World Union for Progressive Judaism. Our group were fortunate enough to meet Alana and Ayal Kaminka, peace activists and members of our Reform, congrega no, Reform Congregation in Sur Hadassah, just outside Jerusalem. They're also the parents of Yanai Kaminka of blessed memory. Yanai was killed on October 7, defending the Zikim army base at which he was stationed in the south. Although he and his unit saved hundreds, including all the members of the nearest kibbutz, his parents were insistent on talking about his life and not his death. The oldest of four siblings, Yanai grew up, as his mother told us, in a household where he'd often come downstairs to see Palestinian neighbors and friends on the couch. As a result of his gentle nature and his upbringing, he was deeply empathetic and introspective. Prior to beginning his service, he brought a Palestinian friend to meet his high school buddies to encourage hearing multiple perspectives before donning the IDF uniform. His father then told us of how when he was in the army, Yanai took a Druze friend of his who was having some trouble with the Hebrew language under his wing and nurtured him to the point where his friend was promoted to being a commander. Yanai cared for his own soldiers to the point where he would often make home visits to them on his precious weekends off or would stay up all night drinking strong Turkish coffee just to speak with them and check in with them. A thoughtful, likely troubled soul, he wrote poetry. Ayal now has a tattoo of one of his son's lines, Rak balayla ro'im kochavim, only at night do we see the stars. At Yanai's funeral, his family and friends left cups of cop coffee on his grave, for they would miss these conversations so. Alana and Ayal's resilience manifests not just in the way that they were able to even talk about their son whilst the wound is still bleeding, but in the way that they make meaning in his memory by fighting for the values they imbued in him, those of compassion, of shared society, of peace, just as Yanai would have wanted. At the end of our time with them, we shared a cup of coffee with Alana and Ayal too. Whilst we continue to admire the resilience of our Israeli brothers and sisters, we Jews in the diaspora have endured too. Since it's uh, becoming a bit of a tradition of mine to tell tales from Camp George at the High Holy Days, some of the best examples of Jewish diaspora resilience were taught from the mouths of the youngest and fiercest among us during my time up there back in August. It was a rainy and cold Shabbat spent sitting in the ulam, the theater hall, with droplets pelting the glass windows and clouds shifting and swirling across the Saturday afternoon sky. It was community leadership Shabbat, in which members of the broader camp family, such as educators and clergy from the Toronto area, are welcome to join for the weekend to get a taste of what the summer has entailed. As part of this special Shabbat, the organizers had arranged for two separate but simultaneous panels, one of high school teens and one of university age staff to speak about their experiences on campus following October 7. 
Admittedly, I was so saddened to hear that what should be such a formative stage of life, full of friends and fun and even some learning, had been so soured in the wake of the current conflict. Every student described the implicit and explicit experiences of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment they had dealt with, from physical attacks to snide comments in classrooms and hallways, to hesitation over singing Israeli or Jewish music for recitals, to mezuzot being ripped off the doorways in the dorms. Two of the high school boys had actually been in Israel on October 7, and hearing their first-hand recount of living that horrible day and dealing with the aftermath back home was harrowing. Plus, dealing with the social media, each of these students, without hesitation, without fail, mentioned how much harder social media had made their lives, with many simply not using it anymore. These teens and young adults furthermore confided that they dreaded the end of the summer when they would need to return to school and face whatever the next semester would throw at them, with none of them having moved or transferred. Conversely, in continuing the conversation with these admirable young, admirable young people, each of them described what a boon their Jewish communities had been for them at this trying time, whether it was the friends from camp they could lean on, the Hillels they had joined, the Shabbat dinners they were attending, or so on. One student described how they ultimately loved living in Montreal and had found a small group of Jewish friends with which to host Shabbat meals and commiserate. The same young woman also described the comfort of simply being able to use terms like booby and zaidi without any explanation, the kind of scenario where those who know will know and won't need to ask questions because it's part of their shared lexicon. Another described how he had joined the board of his Hillel in Ottawa and was participating in a fellowship with Stand With Us for which he'd gone to LA at some point over the summer, ducking out of camp for a few days. Yet another described how she'd just bought a new Magen David necklace and her friend next to her nodded and mentioned how she'd just told off her grandparents for warning her not to wear hers. Each of them vowed to keep educating and advocating for their proud Jewish identities and their Zionism, whether in the classroom or online. They were equally unbelievably grateful also for the break that camp had given them, even if that meant being away from their phones and the internet. With that, they expressed their gratitude especially for the opportunity to be in the safe bubble that camp was providing, where they could live their authentic Jewish lives and be relieved of some of the tension from the outside, if only for a few weeks. The embrace of community and of camp had given many of these students the confidence and the courage to return to their regular lives, more sure of who they were and where they came from. In short, being up at Maple Lake renewed their sense of resilience. The Jewish future will be brightened by their light. There's another term that encompasses these principles of resilience, acknowledging emotion, acting with empathy and making meaning. It's called Active Hope, and it was coined by Joanna Macy and Chris Johnstone. Some of you read their book of the same name with our congregant, Dr. Nate Chirac, earlier this year. Active Hope starts, like in Is Resilience, from a place of acknowledging the mess that we're in, whatever the mess might be, and how it makes us feel. The logic being, how are we meant to begin tackling this mess, this, these difficult emotions, these bleak sounding situations, if we can't even think about them or discuss them in the first place? By the way, John Stone and Macy will write, it's okay to feel anxious or overwhelmed by this unblocking of communication. It's exactly how we're going to find our inner strength, our inner sense of being alive, by facing the mess, we'll discover what we're truly capable of. The word hope, according to Macy and Johnstone, has two meanings. One involves hopefulness itself, 
in which our preferred outcome is likely to happen. The problem comes when we don't fancy our chances and the hope gets stymied. It's a much more passive process. The second meaning is about desire, a vision for what we'd like to see happen and using it as a catalyst towards action. This passive type of hope is about waiting for external agencies to bring about active change. Active hope is about being participatory in moving towards what we want and where we can and when we can, taking steps to bring it into being. In short, we take a clear, realistic view of the world, acknowledging what we see and how we feel. We then identify what we hope for in terms of our vision and actions. Finally, we take steps to move in that direction. What we might notice is that it doesn't actually require optimism. The guiding impetus is intention. We choose what we aim to bring about or to express and let that intention guide us rather than only acting when the odds are in our favor. Returning to my gran again, we grasp just how vulnerable she was and continues to be. She could have just sat around and not done anything about it, believed that the surgery would be too difficult or the rehab too onerous. She and my family could acknowledge absolutely that we were worried. However, in her desire to get better and get back to her life, her family, her friends, her home, her dog, she faced the surgery knowing it would be a long and difficult recovery, spent many weeks in rehab, continues to go to all her doctor's appointments, and even manages coffee with her granddaughter when her granddaughter comes to visit. She's frail, using a walking stick and not venturing too far, but definitely has more of a spring in her step. In other words, my gran didn't necessarily feel optimistic or positive, and sometimes, admittedly, still doesn't. But her vision of what she wants um, to get back to is slowly but surely pulling her through, with her family by her side, of course. Some days are good, some days are not so good, However, she continues to discover what her new normal is going to be, day by day. We'll conclude with an old Hasidic story of a child walking amongst the sun-dappled trees of a forest. The child climbs and plays as children do among the rocks and the moss and the leaves until they realize they're completely lost. The child tries to find their way out, but every trail leads them deeper and deeper into the forest. The sun begins to set and the child becomes afraid. Then they see another child in the distance and cry out, I'm so happy to see you. I'm lost. Can you please help me find my way back? I wish I could, said the other child, but I'm lost too. Take my hand and we'll find our way out together. And the two of them walked together. The Akedah story includes this phrase as a refrain, which can serve as ours two entering 5785, with the lessons from Yana Kaminka, Zichrono Livracha, from our admirable teens and young adults, and from my beloved grandmother. We learn that vulnerability is indeed our friend, and that in fact, we can use it to forge our bravest paths. As we face this next year with resilience, we gather strength in knowing that we will carry the broken tablets, lessen the pain of the knife in our hearts, see the stars in the night sky, and walk through the fearful forest together. Shana Tova.
those who reach for hands. There are those whose faith is wrong, and those who question God's command. My name is Phyllis Denneberg, and I'm president of Holy Blossom Temple. It's so wonderful to be together as we bring in 5785 and celebrate these holy days together. Whether you're here for the first time or this has been your family's home for generations, your membership and commitment to Holy Blossom Temple is valued. We share a special bond as members of the largest reformed synagogue in Canada and one of the most respected throughout the diaspora. Our synagogue continues to grow and be vibrant, responding with so many innovative programs and lectures. Our fall schedule is full. We invite you to peruse all our offerings at our website. I'd like to thank the clergy, the choir, the musicians for tonight's very inspiring service. We're privileged to have such an incredible team at Holy Blossom Temple. And on behalf of the entire congregation, I thank you all for the countless hours that I know you've devoted to preparation these last few months to make these and the upcoming Holy Days so meaningful. Over the next few days, you'll also see many fellow congregants who serve in volunteer roles as ushers, greeters, gabayim, Torah readers, to all of you, I'd like to say thank you for your assistance and the time that you put in to be ready for the High Holy Days. As Rabbi Splansky mentioned, but bears repeating, we have one entrance into the entire Holy Blossom campus. You all came through that door. The main door is from Ava Road, uh, leading into the schwartz Riesman Atrium. Throughout these Holy Days, you'll be exiting the main sanctuary from the back doors of the of the sanctuary to the Bathur Street Plaza. And if you need a ramped exit, I feel like an airplane person. Uh, if you, a ramped exit is available through the Allison Bernard Herman Chapel over here on my right. Our ushers are happy to assist you at the end of the service if you need any help. On behalf of the board of directors, from my family to yours, our warmest wishes for a year of sweetness and continued good health. Shana Tova. Please rise for Kiddush, page 42. <laughs> 
Eloheinu melech haolam Borea peri hagafen Amen Baruch atah Adonai Baruch hu baruch shemo Eloheinu melech haolam אשר בחר בנו מכל העם, ורוממנו מכל לשון, וקידשנו במצוותיו. ותיתן לנו, אדוני אלוהינו, באהבה את יום הזיר. מצרים כיוונו בחרת ואותנו קידשת מכל העמים ולברך האמת וקיים לאר ברוך אתה אדוני על כל הארץ מקדש ישראל ויום הזיכרון.
Blessed is the eternal God, ruler of the universe, for giving us life, for sustaining us, and for enabling us to reach this season. We turn to Alenu on page 43. <laughs> We therefore hope, eternal God, soon to behold the glory of your might. Then will false gods, and you may be seated, vanish from our hearts, and the world will be perfected under your unchallenged rule. And then will all acclaim you as their God, and forsaking evil, turn to you alone. Let all who dwell acknowledge that unto, every knee, unto you every knee must bend, and every tongue swear loyalty. Before you, eternal God, let them humble themselves. To your glorious name, let them give honor. Let all accept the yoke of your sovereignty that you may rule over them soon and forever. For you are sovereign and to all eternity, you will reign in glory as it is written, the eternal God will reign forever and ever. page 45. O oh God, grant that the memory of our loved ones may bring strength and blessing. May the nobility in their lives and the high ideals they cherish endure in our thoughts and live on in our deeds. May we, carrying on their work, help to redeem your promise that life shall yet prevail. We ask the mourners among us to rise at this time that we may acknowledge you and be with you at this time of need. Today, we additionally mark the art site of the following. Albert Abigov, Erwin Barnes, Gordon Siglin, Sari Dicker, Maya Farber, Philip Hanick, Chaya Hochman, Anna Hatna, Bianca Israeli, Norma Kamen, Anita Katzman, Morris Levine, Bernard Ludwig, Vera Margolis, Joseph Nevsky, Francis Olin, Maurice Orenbach, Moshe Privis, Francis Ram, Manuel Rosenberg, Jack Rosner, Zemach Rochstein, Samuel Rubinoff, Chick Sandler, Mary Sapira, and Harry Skolnick. We remember too those who have died most recently and whose families are in those early days of Shloshim. Dr. Rosanna Honig, Dr. M. Henry King, Chris Lotz, Anne Melul, Rebecca Shandling, Faye Singer, Lloyd Ernest Sylvester, Arthur Zimmerman, and the fallen soldiers of Israel, including those who have already been killed in the line of action in Lebanon, together with those who were killed in the terrorist attack in Yafo just, uh, just yesterday or earlier today. Are there any names to be repronounced or added to our prayers of memorial on this sacred Rosh Hashanah?
their memories of what a blessing. We rise as one community to support our mourners and praise God's holy name. Again, page 45. Yit gadal v'yit kadash merabba be'alma divra chirote v'yam lich malchote be'chayechon u'v'yomechon u'v'chayet d'chol b'et Yisrael ba'galav v'zman kariv v'imru. Amen. Yehei shumei rabba mevarach le'alam u'le'almei almaya Yibarach v'yishtabach v'yit pa'ar v'yit ramam v'yit naseh V'yit hadar v'yit ale v'yit halal shmei d'kudasha b'richu L'ela min kol b'yirchata v'shirata Tush b'chata v'nechemata Damiran ve'alma ve'imru Amen Yehei shlama rabba min shmaya V'chayim aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael v'imru Amen Osef shalom b'mramav Hu ya'aseh shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael v'imru Amen May the source of peace send peace to all who mourn and comfort to all who are bereaved. Venomar, together we say, Amen. We conclude with this blessing from our brothers and sisters in the progressive movement in Israel. Yehi ratzon milafanecha Adonai Eloheinu ve'Elohei imotenu ve'avotenu shetechadesh aleinu shana shel orot kochavim sheyau lanu et haderech gam b'shaot hachi chashuchot. May it be your will, Adonai, our God and God of our ancestors, that this new year will be illuminated by the light of stars to show us the way. Even in the darkest of hours, Shana Tovah.